Welcome to Undermine Season 4, Episode 18. We're getting there. I think 46 is the goal of uh, Undermine Season 4. So we're almost halfway there. Um, I'm Tom Marshall, and I'm your fish tour guide. Uh, as we continue onwards, the 25 stops along this uh, Fish 1.0 history. Yes, the 1990s. And uh, we're counting down or up, depending on your view, to fall 1997, the tour when Fish destroyed America. We'll be discussing every fall 97 show on its anniversary. In the meantime, you can catch new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're glad you could make it, and we hope that you play along at home by listening to these Fish shows alongside the corresponding Undermine episodes. We tweet the show days in advance, and you can find us pretty pretty easily on Twitter or Instagram. Um, if you got the memo about today's episode, I'm hoping not all of you went back and listened because I'm hoping that some of you went back and watched. After all, today's show is the Clifford Ball, which was officially released as a seven DVD box set back when such products were sold. In modern times, the video of both days also aired as a back-to-back as back-to-back episodes of Fish's Dinner in a Movie series on YouTube during the pandemic. Speaking of YouTube, those watching can already see that my co-host for today's episode is fellow Undermine executive producer and New York Times bestselling author, Benji Eisen. Welcome back, Benji. Hi, excuse me. Hi, Tom. (laughs) Hello. We have uh, arrived, as I think you uh, alluded to, episode 18. And, you know, that seems appropriate because the Clifford Ball, in some ways... It was fish suddenly old enough to vote and uh, and be tried as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, fish had been growing and growing and growing and growing. It's such a rapid clip. In, in 1994, I saw them in a hotel ballroom up in Canada in a theater that was so empty in Montreal, the balcony was closed off. And then here we are just two years later in fish's parking lot was the ninth large, the Fish's parking lot was the ninth largest city in the state of New York with a temporary population that was four times the size of that entire county. So if you think about that for a minute, so here we are, we're summer 1996, it's Fish's first festival. They're the only band playing this festival. It's time for our little band that could to come out, kind of come of age. Yeah. Uh, they're 18 now, you know, <laughs> and what better place uh, to do that than a decommissioned Air Force base in New York? <laughs> it was August uh, 16th, August 17th, 1996. I remember that because I was there, Tom, I think you were there. I know you were there. Uh, do you remember actually uh, where you first heard about the Clifford Ball? I was definitely there, um, just to set that straight. Uh, As far as hearing about it, it was one of those things, I couldn't give you an exact time because it's one of those things I heard about piecemeal from Trey and the band, like like on the bus or at shows. Like it was something like long before it was announced, I knew about the idea and they'd been planning it and working on the concept for a while. So I wasn't unfamiliar with the idea, but it grew to something kind of crazy in my head that I couldn't conceive of because there was so much that went into the planning. And there's so much that Trey kind of tried to explain to me and I got lost in the concept, like a central town they were building and the art that was, was coming together and integrating the camping and a midnight flatbed and an acoustic set. I, I knew I would just have to go and experience it rather than try to envision it. So I rented an RV right away for the dates when, when they were announced and, and made sure I had a group of pals free up their schedules and, and I got my mountain bike ready to go. <laughs> well, you always remember where you were. Uh, and here we are. We lived the telltale. If you've been enjoying this season of Undermine, then please consider subscribing to Cyrus Premium on Apple, where you will get ad-free podcasts, bonus episodes, and more. Okay, Tom, tell us who's going to be in today's hot seat. Since this is the Clifford Ball Squared, we thought our first guest should naturally be the man who created the actual ball square. And if you don't know what that is, it is what it sounds like. It's kind of the central activity hub uh, in the festival where you could walk around and interact and not just with other fans, but also with performance artists and art installations that today's guest created. And the hope was that this area was a launching pad for all kinds of adventures, some curated, some kind, some not. Um, If you've been to a fish festival or even Bonnaroo, 
and enjoy the art gardens and general artistic vibe, you very likely have Lars Fisk to thank. And we're going to bring him on now from his shipping container home via satellite. Um, let's see if he pops in here. There he is. Lars, how are you? Hi, Tom. How you doing? Doing amazing. And we got Benji here, too. <laughs> Hi, Benji. <laughs> Hi, Lars. <laughs> so, Lars, it's fantastic to have you here today for a look back on the Clifford Ball, in large part because of the experience that you conceived of and, and curated. Um, but before we get into that aspect of it, um, in 1996, bring us up to date. You're a Ver you're a Vermont artist, right? And before the band ever contacted you for business, were you a Fish fan already? Oh, I was. Yeah, I mean, I was a pretty young dude at that point. I was just out of college and. There throughout high school I was I was into it and uh, fish was big presence in Burlington at that time well can you kind of tell us and walk us through how you came to be involved with the Clifford ball because uh you know I, I'm what I want to know is like what was the initial proposition did somebody from their office walk across the street to where your office was and say, we want you to be the art director for our festival. <laughs> did it start smaller? Uh, well, it was kind of the other way around in that, you know, we were in our little arts community there in South Burlington um, doing our annual open studios event, you know, where everybody hosts uh, folks to come and see what they're up to. And um, myself and my friend Pascal Spangeman were hanging an exhibition in the Maltex building across the street from where my studio was. We were, we were involved in the administration a bit too. So we were hanging a show and we just came to meet the, the folks of Dainese in Productions who had recently moved into that building. And so we quickly became pals and uh, it wasn't long after that meeting that they wandered back over the street and and it said that the band was going to do this big event and would we care to participate in, in some way as visual artists? So that's how that came about. That's amazing. And they must have like seen something in your art that they knew it would be compatible because like, or maybe it just became compatible because it's synonymous almost your art with fish now, but um, the band and their management and the promoter, we're all thinking of this as, as building a music festival but they ended up actually reinventing the concept of a music festival or redefining what, what was possible. Had you been to music festivals before this? I, I kind of want to know the context you had going into this for what you were about to help reimagine. I, I really hadn't. Um, you know, there, were, there weren't too many to attend in those at, at that time. So I, I really hadn't been to any big festival, maybe a show with a, a small handful of bands, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have called it a, a festival in the way that we speak of them today. Some people so say that was, was, I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea what to expect. Some people said that bread and puppet, which was a fish, a uh, big, huge puppet show influenced you or, or them. In, yes, in some of the art. True. Yeah. 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 That, that would probably be the most, event uh, that you could compare it to most easily and that was definitely on our radar as vermont artists for sure well, and that, Lars, it, yeah uh, go on tom well no i was just going to say could you tell us like in a sentence what what bread and puppet was because some people don't know well um it was a theatrical performance that often place took took place outdoors and it was, oh, we won't really get into the themes, highly politicized themes, but the format was a performance involving a lot of props and enormous puppets. Huge. And, um, and so it, it, it really expanded way beyond what you might think of as puppeteering or stage performance. It was... It was so interactive and all about um, the surroundings and being in the performance space and having these larger than life um, figures enact this theater. That's it. Perfect. Lars, as, as you were working on the Clifford Ball conceptually, 
I want to know who came up with like their overhead view of what it would look like. Like, did did somebody say, "Hey, we want a ball square with interactive structures," or did they kind of just let you loosen the sandbox? Well, at the Clifford Ball, I was I was I was a freshman. I mean, I did not I didn't know. Like I said, I didn't know what was going. I really didn't have quite all of the. Um, curatorial um, responsibilities that I came to have later. Russ Bennett really needs to be credited for having organized the, the overarchi- overarching architecture of, of that format. Um, I was at that point just more or less just given a, a piece of real estate within Russ's organization. Mm. And so that's where that was my smaller arena. I I, I think that you're right about Russ. Um, I often think about you and Russ as a package that came together. Was that was that correct, or did that just sort of yeah. happen? Okay. Yeah, it 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 came to be a, a partnership that just worked somehow. Because uh, I mean, in those early years, uh, we were. So we were very different people, um, yet we somehow worked together and found some sort of balance that really worked between design and architecture and 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 art and art artistry of all kinds um, to get where we got. It it, it occurs to me, um, and this is going off script a little bit, um, but. It occurs to me that you, me, and Benji know so much about Clifford Ball, and it made such an impression on us that we're kind of possibly leaving people out who weren't there. Could you sort of just describe what what it was like? Because um, everyone knows what a music festival is. They open the gates, you know, you camp, and then you open the gates and you go to the stage. This was completely different. <laughs> different. Can you describe sort of how it was different? Well, um, much like we were just saying about Bread and Puppet, it was like a 360-degree immersive performative event where um, eating and being occupied, entertained, um, playing, listening was all part of the environment. And it was a large physical area that could be wandered around and where – one could experience and a, a number of things. That's how I best describe it. I love it, and and of course we're talking about Plattsburgh Air Force Base up in New York. It was a decommissioned Air Force Base. Did you at all worry about the vibe of like you know this is Air Force or or military or did you just see a a, a blank canvas? Well, that did have a sort of a. a, a cast us some sort of, I wouldn't say gloom, but it was, <laughs> it was a vibration that was there for sure. And it took a lot of effort to, um, to transcend that. Tons of concrete. <laughs> yeah. A lot of concrete and a lot of big flat nothingness. <laughs> but it, it also led kind of to, uh, I guess it, it kind of, force fed this uh, or forced you to kind of create this space where I remember arriving to the Clifford ball and kind of as you're going in, you're seeing these visual clues that led you to, you know, almost like a portal where once you entered the grounds, you were no longer on a natural decommissioned air force base. You were in this, you know, like, uh, I, I don't want to say game hand, you know, but you were, you were in this kind of like, even even waiting in line through the gates, you're looking up and you're seeing what normally would be a water tower. Instead, it's disguised with Groucho Marx glasses. You know, because <laughs> uh, every little thing like that, uh, you know, really created a vibe that you were stepping through a portal. And and for the weekend, we were going to be in a place that doesn't usually exist. That's such an interesting uh, description of the experience. I mean, I. I never really had that myself uh, because we we were on the other side of the curtain and watching it grow incrementally, which for us was always the most the greatest part about these product. Seeing <laughs> this 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 universe come together, and and um, seeing um, how 
well it could be done and how magical that that transformation was was really that was my perspective and i love that part of it this uh and it's been said by uh, music historians and lots of writers and stuff that this influenced um what became bonnaroo outside lands and tons of music events to follow and for you did that mean did that lead to additional employment opportunities like can you talk about what you did after this uh, that this uh opened the door for oh well it's interesting because there did seem to be a lot of opportunities like you said it was just this this explosion of this whole this whole new format that had been that had been defined um and i'm not sure if it was just uh my own position but i always i always just felt like containing it to uh dealing with with fish um you know, others, of, of course, within our company or various departments split off and did any number of different projects. Um, but I never did. I, I, I participated whenever invited um, with the band, with Fish, and, and did nothing else. Well, you know, the, uh, the the Clifford Ball, it kind of demolished the walls of what was possible with uh, a music festival. You know, um, we are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, uh, I want to talk about Woodstock 99. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want to talk more Clifford Ball with Lars Fisk. But first... Have you ever wondered what it would feel like if your investments reflected what matters most to you? At Green Future Wealth Management, the advisors specialize in helping clients manifest their values in their financial lives. Green Future Wealth Management was founded by certified financial planner practitioner and longtime fan Nick Cantrell, named by Forbes as one of the top next-gen wealth advisors in the country. Whether you are just getting started or have complex investing and financial planning needs, visit them on the web at greenfuturewealth.com. You can sign up for the email list or take the investing values quiz. When you feel ready, schedule a free virtual consultation. In appreciation for the amazing fish community and the incredible work being done by fans across the country, Green Future Wealth Management will be donating 10% of asset management proceeds from new Osiris listener clients to fans for racial equity. Just be sure to mention Osiris when booking your appointment. Create your green future. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research Inc, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc. Cambridge and Green Future Wealth are not affiliated. And we're back. We still have Lars Fisk, the art director of the Clifford Ball with us. Lars, um, I say art director of Clifford Ball, um, but you continued to work with Fish on many festivals after this one. Did you work on all of them? Um, most, Mostly. Um, there were just a few here and there that were missed for reasons I don't even remember, but uh, I was always really up for any participation at any level, whether it be the festivals or the very occasional uh, New Year's Eve gig at Madison Square Garden. Um, I, I did quite a, a number of them, yeah. You know, I'm I'm guessing that you know our on you alluded to this earlier actually, but I'm guessing that our on-site experiences during these festivals were significantly different because of our roles, me as a fan and you as a you know the the art director. Um, you know, I'm so I'm front of house, noting every note, you know, doing my thing during the actual Clifford Ball event. Once once the gates were open and once you see this sea of people swarming in. What was your on-site experience like? Can you kind of like walk us through what your experience there during the weekend was? Did you get to enjoy the music at all? Did you did you watch people interact with the art? Oh yeah, all of the above. Um, the thing that was most uh, dynamic for me, especially in those earlier events that I was involved with, was that I came at this from a from the standpoint as a sculptor and um and also as a designer um you know it was an architectural problem at 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 first but it was also what i immediately realized particularly clifford ball was that it was performative role 
And so when the gates open and the crowd flows in, it's, it's showtime for all of us. And I hadn't considered myself any type of performer whatsoever. You know, I just worked out of my own studio. So it was, it was an experience at that point that was performative and we were, we were on. Speaking of that, and um, jumping around a little bit, uh, uh, Benji, uh, but basically, uh, I have a, you're, I think I read an interview with you, and you said that one of the art installations you did that was very interactive was like sort of laundry lines hung sort of in the shape of St. Peter's Basilica or something that influenced by Vatican City. Um, yeah. And basically, it was like cloth, and you supplied acrylic paint, and people could paint on it, and then you had clothespins, and with the idea that they would hang them up and it would become, uh, you know, a developing art piece over time. And uh, I was wondering if you recalled um, specifically where that sort of the fans started coloring outside the line, so to speak, because I have a particular friend and he was on uh, an earlier undermine. His name is Scott Gray, who took the acrylic paint and instead of painting the cloth, started painting the plywood walls and um then he as they got moved along the, the walls they found your mother load of um latex paint you in, in all different colors <laughs> and, and started painting they painted the walls and they painted people and he said yeah. dur- he said during slave he remembers a bunch of uh security guards came up and they had folded their arms and they kind of went <clears throat> and they were scared that they're going to be in trouble and the security guard said it needs more blue. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just uh, before I ask my question about that, um, fast forwarding four years to Oswego, uh, my friend Scott found one of those plywoods with his handprint and his wife's handprint signature um, in the entryway of the Oswego entrance. <laughs> so you guys saved all that stuff. Well, some of it was recycled, I suppose. Uh, yes, uh, raw materials. Uh, sure, uh, that that was surprising that he would come to find that small moment within such a large, vast <laughs> amount of material. So I was wondering, like, if you're, you know, if your full time job, like during the during the the show, um, is like, you know, sort of refereeing these elaborate psychedelic playgrounds or if uh you're you're kind of having fun too or or all the above well yeah yeah that's a good question there is a lot of refereeing because you never know how anyone will will interact with such an environment um and it was all fantastical there was no proper way to interact with this we didn't really have a prescribed way to utilize this stuff or or experience it so in many ways yeah it was a bit of refereeing if you know someone decided they're going to climb 30 feet up a a a vertical gate then maybe that's not the best idea Uh, (laughs) so yes it was it was a bit of uh, a circus once it all and it became activated anything Uh, go anything go wrong like any any uh any any people need refereeing in particular that you recall? Oh, there were always uh, <laughs> some grittier moments. Yeah, uh, nothing specific come to mind. Maybe too gross to mention <laughs> on it. Really, like injury involved? Oh, involving uh, just human needs. Okay, well, <laughs> leave it at that. Well. well we've used the term circus and uh, and psychedelic <laughs> playground and you know both of those to me ring kind of true when i think back on these festivals and the, the clifford ball certainly started uh getting the ball rolling i guess uh on <laughs> these things and every every festival since then had reimagined it in its own way but with a new theme and a new uh you know just new uh elements at play but it all seems to be part of one larger you know, uh, continuing narrative in a way. So, you know, when I think about these things, like when I think about the psychedelic playground, the very first thing that comes to my mind was my favorite fish installation, which was Sunk City, it, it, 
uh, yeah. you know, where they had a half buried Bob's big boy statue. And I remember participating in masking tape, uh, you know, taking this masking tape and, and wrapping it around the trees and, and being a physical part of it, which was also pretty, pretty, uh, you know, amazing and illuminating and all, all these things. Um, of of all the festival installations that you've worked on for Fish over the years, do you have one that immediately comes to mind when you think back on them? I, I do. I always think back to Lemon Wheel um, because it, we were really, we had really hit our stride at that point. And it was, like I said earlier, the, that was a luring Air Force Base up in uh, Northeast Maine, um, that hosted that particular show. And I think what struck me as an interesting variation on that particular landscape was that we, we did earthworks. I mentioned before that these yeah. spaces were so flat and um, I really wanted to sort of push beyond that somehow. So we brought in a lot of earth and fill and created a, a real undulating landscape onto which we'd mapped uh, all our uh, typical architectural pieces to serve certain purposes. Um, so for me, it was Lemon Wheel. That's cool. I totally remember like climbing up almost like a, a little mountain or hillock or whatever you'd call it. And then there was sort of almost like a Japanese pagoda with views of, of all the festival. And then I guess you just sort of walked down the other side. And I think there yeah. might've even been water around it. Yeah, we put in a pond and a waterfall and- <laughs> It was incredible. It was extreme. Yeah, really, really extreme. Um, since, since we have you here, and I don't know when else I might find you to ask you this, um, uh, Curveball was of course, hugely disappointing to everyone that it was canceled. Um, but I had an opportunity to sort of be led around the grounds um, well, everyone, presumably you two were still working on getting stuff going. And I saw a big sphere up in the air and I was wondering without giving away any corporate secrets or, or, or government secrets, um, if you could tell us what that would have turned into. Um, well, that was funny because it was as much a surprise to me as it was uh, to you <laughs> in that I, I wasn't involved in the design of that particular piece. Oh. And I wasn't certain what was going to happen with it either. Um, you know, by that point, the, the team of designers and artists had grown to such a uh, magnitude that, um, yeah, there were elements there that were beyond what, um, beyond me, beyond what I was really involved with. It, it was, it had a life of its own, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole world of it. It had become a world and it was vast. I think, I think that since, you know, um, people might know you did the cover of Round Room. And I think in this day and age of like graphics and computer graphics and Photoshop, people might think that that, that wasn't a real thing but you created a round ball that kind of looked like a barn. Yes. And, and when I saw that sphere, I was like, Oh, that that's Lars. That's Lars's. <laughs> but it turns out it was more like a technology thing than a, than, than an art thing you think, or you would say. Oh, that's the sphere we were talking about a moment ago. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I know that it was intended for all kinds of very fancy AV equipment, oh, which cool. is, um, yeah, not exactly my department. You know, I was yeah. more the nuts and bolts and physical uh, stuff that was didn't involve buttons. Got it. Got it. You, you know, Tom, you mentioned uh, the the Roman element uh, or inspiration uh, with Great Went. You know, I'm not sure, Lars, that you know, casual fans always pick up on these themes that that you guys are playing off of. But I also think that that might be a part of why it works. You know, uh, like Sunk City that we just talked about, it, it you could say that it looked like a, it was the future buried in a past that was still in our future. You know, you have all, uh, yeah, is good. You have all these, you have all these elements. Um, <laughs> do you, when you're creating these, these pieces and when you're thinking from the bird's eye view in the very beginning planning stages, 
is it kind of like, do you have an objective to get people to think about the experience uh, in a certain way? Or, uh, you know, when they interact with these sculpted artscapes, which is really, you know, this this whole universe, like we were saying before, um, is that what you're, you're, you're kind of going for? Or is your intent simply all for our delight? Well, these themes, we're, they, they, they may have been sort of coming from uh, an, a place of absurdity uh, that, that I really uh, related to in the music and in the lyrics, um, the storytelling, the mythologies, the characters, the places, the events weren't necessarily uh, logical. But I think the themes, they served a purpose in that it, it became, they became a springboard for other performance and other artists to take hold of or spring from to voice their own sort of ideas and projects that, that would tie it all together into a somewhat cohesive world, but it would all still remain very fantastical. Bringing it back around to the Clifford Ball, what were some of the elements that went into the Clifford Ball that, that people may have forgotten about or may have not even realized at the time, or if they weren't there, you know, would never have heard about? Do you, do you remember like some of the things, some of the themes that you guys were playing off of? Well, at, at that, in that particular show, being the very first, I mean, I was as much uh, mystified as everyone else. And so... I, I couldn't really put my finger on any singular, more um, identifiable theme. Um, but it was at that point that I realized that something so vast and so chaotic could benefit from some kind of logic to it, some sort of logic, logic in the mind, some sort of concept that people could, it, could, begin to perceive and then it might may guide their experience somewhat it seemed like there was always some sort of theme that you know that that you could at least hold on to when you first walk in you sort of even if you couldn't sort of articulate what it was uh it was at least you know happiness or fantasticalness or something and i think it was uh embodied at least at clifford ball with that that big banner everyone walked under our intent is all for your delight, which the wording of is so strange that it sticks in your mind. Did that come from uh, you guys? Well, yes, um, that was, uh, that was embraced as a motto. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it has its origin somewhere. It was a quotation from, um, from a source that, I can't think of right now. Uh, I think it may well have been a photographer, actually. Um, one that had found such a, a saying somewhere in, in their own travels and had photographed this, uh, if memory serves me right. Uh, but that, that saying, that, that really was embraced as a motto, and that's why it, um, it had that that sort of impact. I think it really made a lot of sense. It really described the, the general feeling of what we were trying to do for those fans. It, it absolutely does. And it sets an expectation in the fan mind as, uh, as to what type of uh, weekend it's going to be. I think, like I said earlier, it's kind of like a portal. And then there was another fest. I'm not sure. Maybe it was lemon wheel, but there it was uh the area was called the garden of infinite pleasantries oh yes <laughs> uh which i i also thought kind of you know that immediately you hear that and it's unusual but it also immediately kind of sets your expectation for what your experience is gonna be like which was infinitely pleasurable uh yeah. <clears throat> but, that was borrowed also from eastern thought yeah, yeah, absolutely. But Lars, when you're creating these these gardens of infinite pleasantries, uh, how involved uh, and how much in communication are you in with the with the band members? Well, um, erratically, I will say. Uh, oftentimes, there's a big push when the band has decided to undertake another one of these festivals, 
And there's always a big moment where we all get together and just brainstorm. And if there are idea, people are coming into the room with ideas, it all gets thrown out there. And it, it, it feels infinite and it's all pleasant. And usually it's all undertaken. <laughs> that's a that's a kind of a nice way to end. I mean, there's so much more that um, Benji and I would want to ask you, but I think we're even we're we've gone a little bit long for our our format. Um, but uh, I would urge anyone to um, check out LarsFisk.com if you're interested in Lars's art. But also, there's so many photos of Clifford Ball, and uh, like Benji uh, referenced, there's a, a video, uh, or I referenced a DVD set of it as well. So there's video, and uh, it's a really incredible visual uh, thing as well as unbelievably musical. Uh, but Lars, um, thank you for setting the uh, stage for us, and thank you for creating and and bringing so much pleasure to Fish fans over the years. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. It was fun. It's been very great have, talking with you today. And um, uh, and thank you to my co-host, Benji Eisen, and our fellow executive producers, RJB and Matt Dwyer. And thanks everyone out there in podcast land. If you like us, come back for more. Remember to review and subscribe wherever you listen or watch. Thank you, guys. Osiris. <laughs>